Good morning and welcome to Tech Days Online. Today we're going to be talking about a couple of subjects. The first one that we're going to start the day with is Windows Server 2012. And then we're going to go into an afternoon of looking at Windows Azure. And we're going to use Steve Plank to talk you through everything that is new and exciting about Windows Azure. However, to start the day off, um, I'm joined by Andrew Fryer. And my name is Simon May. And we're going to be talking to you a little bit about, tech, about uh, Windows Server 2012. We're going to start the day with a rough agenda that's going to take us through file generate. what's new in the file generation of uh, Windows Server. And that's your favorite feature, I think, isn't it, Simon? It is. Yes, it is one of my favorite features of Windows Server 2012. Well, whereas my favorite feature would be multi-server management, uh, being able to look after lots of machines in, from one place. Absolutely. And being able to do things like PowerShell. We've got virtual machine migration. Absolutely. The ability for us to um, take virtual machines and move them around within our environment to place them wherever we need to um, to get our workloads into the right place. And while networking may not be the most exciting project on the world, if it's not working absolutely tip top, then everything else we've just talked about is all for nothing. Absolutely. Yes, we need to make sure that the network is running really, really well. Whilst we go through uh, various things today, it's important for you guys to know that we have moderators available uh, online to answer your questions. And you can also ask questions directly of Andrew and I uh, throughout the morning and also of Steve Plank this afternoon during the afternoon session on Windows Azure. We're also going to have a couple of breaks throughout the day so that you can go away, check on your um, dashboards back at the office, make sure that things are functioning properly, and please feel free to dip in and dip out of the live stream as and when you need to. We'll have a 30-minute uh, tea break around about the middle of the morning. And if you're watching a recording of this, obviously that's all irrelevant, and we'll get started right away. Absolutely. So the first thing we are going to look at is the next generation file server that is built into Windows Server 2012. We have lots of really, really neat features powered by something called SMB3. What is SMB3? Well, it's the new SMB2. It is the new version of the server message block protocol, which basically allows us to move our files around the network in a far more efficient way. It also lets us do really fast handoffs on uh, file servers. And there's a whole load of extra features as well that don't require SMB3. Things like data deduplication, things like storage spaces mm. that allow us to um, almost virtualize our storage. Think of it in a slightly more flexible way than perhaps we're used to in the past. Right, OK. Well, let's start having a look at that, Simon. So um, there are lots and lots of features inside of um, what we have new in SMB3 and inside the, new, uh, the next generation file server. We've just talked very quickly about SMB3, but some cool stuff there. We support things like RDMA, so the ability to um, offload directly onto the network card in order to be able to do faster data transfers mm. between parts of our network. We also have uh, the ability to take our storage spaces, a new way of designing storage inside of Windows Server 2012, and actually bringing lots of different types of disk from different types of disk controller, from different speeds of disk, from different capacities of disk, and actually combine them together in far more flexible ways than we've ever been able to in the past. And also, we can add extra resiliency inside that so that we can still have mirrored sets, we can still have parity sets, we can have set, um, sets without any of that kind of protection as well. There's a new file system as well, the uh, REFS, or the Resilient File System, which changes the way that we read and write to the disk and makes things much more resilient inside the way that bits are actually laid down uh, on the disk itself. And speaking of resiliency, one of the other things we need to be able to do is um, if we're going to throw up a share with all the company's vital documents on, wouldn't it be good if we could cluster that? So if uh, it's always going to be there, no matter, no matter what we're doing, either planned or, um, God forbid, unplanned things. Absolutely. And we've also been able to um, make, make it so that the, uh, the storage spaces can be clustered as well. Mm. And we have improvements to cluster shared volumes. Previously, something that you would have had to have used with Hyper-V in order to be able to um, deploy Hyper-V virtual machines onto a cluster shared volume. Now we can use cluster shared volumes for file storage as well. We also have uh, features such as um, being able to um, back up directly to Windows Azure Blob Storage. So instead of having to have all those nasty tape drives um, inside my organization, I can actually just back directly up into some Blob Storage inside of Windows Azure, which may well be very, very useful for certain people. I also like the fact that I, I, I like this idea of uh, multi-channel, the fact that if I'm on a Windows 8 machine um, and I'm seeing that pulling down that whacking great deck that I've just created is taking a bit of time, if I plug in an Ethernet cable, it's going to see that straight away, increase the bandwidth, pull that file down quicker, um, and then if the wireless drops off, it's going to continue to copy. And if I don't actually, uh, if I break a connection and maybe go somewhere else or up to another meeting that I've got you know, this afternoon, I can just plug back in again. It's going to continue where it left off. 
little things like that that mean so much to people, cutting down on the, on the help desk calls and also getting rid of some of the drudgery of uh, looking after all this stuff. Absolutely. And one of the other features, in fact, my, hands down, my favourite feature of Windows Server 2012 is data deduplication. And we will look at data deduplication services as well uh, inside of this session, have a look at how we can start to save really quite vast amounts of uh, storage mm. spaces, um, sorry, of uh, space on your storage. Um, I've had some people that we've been talking to at our, uh, our in-person events, at our IT camps, sending me their data deduplication results. And looking at those results, we're seeing, um, I think the lowest number that I've had sent to me is 22, and the highest number is 95% of storage space saved. So the person who has saved 95% of storage space, um, they're actually using 5% of the disk that they once were in order to save their, uh, their libraries of virtual machines. I think the other thing about all this is, is, the, is the enormous performance. I mean, if you'd have said, I don't know, 10 years ago, um, we're going to store your databases on a file share, people would look at you sideways. Certainly the DBA guys that I know would. Um, but now we can store not just uh, data, highly performing databases on those file shares, we can even store the actual um, virtual hard disks that sit under a virtual machine. And actually, the virtual machine state can be on a share. So we're kind of insulating you a little bit from some of the complexities of storage, things like sand management, things like understanding uh, you know, how um, fiber channel and so on, and that sort of stuff works. We've just got stuff to work with. So perhaps we should stop talking and have a look at it, Simon? Well, what absolutely. Let's, let's explain a little bit around, yeah, uh, okay. around things like um, around resilient file system. So the resilient file system basically means that we can do some really neat things. We've all been sat there waiting for a check disk to complete mm. for hours and hours and hours. Um, that happens very, very much more quickly with uh, ReFS. If we implement ReFS, we can expect check disks to run um, literally in a few seconds to fix the, uh, the corrupted data that's on that disk. And that's mainly because we're actually reading and writing that data in a slightly different way. When we normally write data to a hard disk, what we do is check to see if the data is already there. Mm -hmm. And if it is already there, we'll skip it because that's quicker. However, now disk speeds have caught up. So instead of having to skip that data, we can write every time. And by doing that, we can write into a slightly different sector every time. Mm -hmm. And that actually gives us um, the data, actually moves the data around on the disk, preventing sectors from uh, being corrupted. And if we do write to a corrupt sector, then the chances are that we're going to rewrite that data very quickly to a non corrupt sector. Hence, it improves our overall um, disk stability. We've got more of a database approach there, cataloging where the disks are and so on and so forth. And it's scanning that becomes a lot more efficient than the um, file tables that we had in, in older file systems like NTFS. So, there are um, our huge sort of enterprise scale reliability um, improvements there, but I guess we're just getting started with that. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, there are some, and we'll go through this as we go through the session today, some places where you can have REFS or you can have something else. So it's a question of understanding the choices today, I think, as well. Isn't it, it is, absolutely, yes. We want to go through uh, lots of those kind of choices and that kind of mm. stuff that we'll see. Storage space is, is probably one of the, um, the newest features of Windows Server 2012, probably one of the most exciting from a, uh, from a storage point of view because it allows us to be um, that much more flexible because just like in the, in the world of virtual machines, we've actually virtualized storage. So it becomes less uh, intrinsically linked to the physical hardware that we have underneath. So if we take a look at this particular slide that we, um, yep. that we have building here, the, uh, the slide actually shows us that we have some physical storage in space and on that physical storage, um, we actually take that up and separate it out. So those disks can be any different types. You can see on this slide that we actually have um, some gray storage, some blue storage, some really big blue storage, indicating that they are different types of disk, yep. different speeds of access to that disk. We then turn those pools into a storage space. And those storage spaces can span um, and take the disk from multiple storage pools. So a group of disk can actually be a member of multiple storage pools, which again gives you extra flexibility in the way that you provision that disk. If you think of um, maybe creating a, raised, a set of RAID disks, that's something you wouldn't be able to do there. You wouldn't be able to um, take a, a group of disks and then split it between two RAID arrays. And what looks kind of strange on that diagram there is that little um, slightly darker blue triangle in there. It looks like you've actually got a disk being appearing in two different pools, Simon. Uh, yes, I'm not sure that that's completely possible. I think that's a, uh, a slight, um, a slight um, exaggeration by the slide there, but uh, it's, uh, it's certainly uh, one overlap that, uh, that potentially could happen. And then on top of our storage spaces, we can yeah. do various different things. We can run our uh, Hyper-V workloads, we can mm -hmm. run our databases, we can run our, um, our SMB uh, file storage. We can run failover clustering. Everything that we would expect to be able to run on normal physical disk can actually be run off of a disk created out of the storage space. 
The way we've got this slide laid out, Simon, have we got it? Have we got this set up so that, for example, if I'm using it for Hyper-V, I wouldn't then be able to use um, other things on it, that storage space, or is that? Is that just a, a lower level of abstraction within that? Well, it depends on the way that you create your space. Right. Um, you can, when you want to place um, storage on there, uh, such as Hyper-V virtual machines, mm -hmm. you'll create that share in a slightly different way. You'll create an application share. And by creating an application share, um, we're actually turning on and off certain features of yep. the file server and of SMB. That um, can mean that certain features are unavailable to you on an application share. Yep. So something like data deduplication, for example, um, won't run on an against an application share. However, um, there's nothing to stop you from being able to store data on that application share alongside your virtual machines. Right. What you do have to think about is the right way to do this, and what, what particular parts of my data do I want on what particular shares of what particular type. And that particular type thing is probably one of the newest things that we've introduced in Server 2012, the ability to create different types of file shares. So, so, this, so different shares can live on the same storage pool, each one for a specific purpose? Absolutely, yeah. Right. Okay, just want to be clear in my yeah, simple side of mind. Okay, thanks for that. And then on top of all of that, uh, those different uh, types of data that we can place onto that share, we can then have different services. So we can mm. deploy uh, in virtual, virtualized environments or actually in physical environments. Yeah. There is nothing that ties storage spaces down to just being used inside of a virtualization or a database or a share environment. So if I wasn't, for example, if I created a virtual machine and I wanted to create um, storage spaces on it, I'm, there's no dependency on, on that virtual machine running on Hyper-V, for example? Absolutely. But we'd rather you did. Yes, completely. So there's, there are um, there are those kind of advantages as well, and and also uh, one of the great advantages of using storage spaces is that we can just start to expand them as and when we need to. Yeah. So as okay. we'll see here, this storage pool has just been increased in size, mm -hmm. and we've just expanded out the storage space, which is looking at that storage pool. That means that we can do things like say that uh, there's a vast amount more um, available data, available storage than we actually have the physical storage space for. That gives us some really good advantages, such as not having to go and extend partitions all the time. Particularly really useful if we have live virtual machines running against that environment. We would have to, um, if we had to extend the partition, take down that share, yeah. turn off all of those virtual machines, extend the partition, bring the share back up, then turn all the virtual machines back on. So we can, we can ha have kind of just-in-time storage. As, as the business demands it, we can grow. All we know we need to do is make sure that uh, you know, we can, whoever it is we're buying our hardware from can turn that around in fairly short order. We can bolt it in while it's running. They'll never know. Um, they'll think they're on a bigger volume than they've actually got. Yeah. Have I got that Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, completely. Okay. So we have um, the ability to extend our storage. We have the ability to um, grow our storage vertically as well um, by passing it through to lots of different layers of our architecture. OK. And so if we think about our ability to store um, applications on that, we can obviously use um, cluster shared volumes as well, mm -hmm. as we mentioned right at the beginning. And in that case, we might want to place that cluster shared volume um, across a bunch of different types of disk. Yep. Um, what is a cluster shared volume? You're much better on this bit than me. Well, if you imagine that, uh, hopefully you can see my two uh, laptops here. Um, they could be connected up to a SAN. And when we introduced uh, the, the ability to move virtual machines from one node on a cluster over to another node over, over here, then um, we found that handing off ownership of um, a LUN on a SAN was taking something like a second, far too long for live migration. So we introduced this abstraction layer, cluster shared volumes, between the, between the shared storage um, and the nodes on the cluster, so that although this might still own that node, this node has actually got the rights to read to it, and this one hasn't at the moment. And that's much easier for us to, um, to then be able to move virtual machines without them turning off, what we, we call live migration. And what we've done now is we've kind of extended that concept into the world of just general file storage. So you wouldn't just have CSVs just for um, putting your virtual machines on. We now have other, other uses for them. And we'll see how that's set up as we go through the day. Absolutely. And just to, um, to explain a little bit of the, uh, the lingo there for anybody who's never touched with a CSV before, a cluster shared volume is literally disk which is um, available to a group of different servers. Yeah. So it is literally shared and accessible from mm. each different server, and those servers tend to form a cluster. Yeah, but underneath we have actually got real shared storage. So we might have um, SAS disks, mm -hmm. we might have a, a traditional sun, uh, SAN shared out on iSCSI, or it might even be fiber channel. Yeah, absolutely. Again, could be physical, could, could, could be virtual. So on top, of that, uh, on top of that cluster share volume, we might do something like place a file share. Yep. And we might actually, on top of that file share, place our um, Hyper-V servers. We mm -hmm. might place our databases. 
all of that kind of thing. We could yeah. swap out that, um, that RAID disk that we had in that previous uh, iteration of the diagram there for some disk which is actually provisioned using a SAN. And that SAN could actually be presenting uh, LUNs into each of those virtual machines. It would actually be the same LUN that it's presenting into each, into each um, cluster uh, yeah. member of that machine. And it does play nice with SANs, you don't, but you don't, equally you don't have to have a SAN to, to play with this technology. So it's all about choice. It's maybe about making better use of your SAN or removing some blockers inside your organisation that you don't understand really how a SAN works or that it's taking so long. I think you've worked in some businesses where it took a long time to get LUNs on a SAN. So. Absolutely, yes. The, the classic example is working in, um, in large organisations where everything is um, constrained by uh, the requirements for ITIL, quite rightly so. Um, it's uh, great in terms of uh, making sure that IT is run with uh, lots of rigour and uh, according to the needs of the users, but it can sometimes be slow and frustrating for those who are working in it. So a great example of that for me was um, previously working in an organisation where if I wanted some space on, uh, on top of the, uh, the SAN, I'd have to raise a change request, which would typically take around about six weeks from me raising that request all the way through to it landing. So with this kind of technology, the ability to deliver over file, soft, over file shares, that actually brings us right down and increases the, um, the speed of provisioning that we have available to us. So let's just uh, move over to our demo environment for a moment and show these guys some of this stuff. Yeah, yeah, because we actually normally aren't used to using PowerPoint, as you can probably tell. We normally yes. just prefer to talk about we do. stuff yep. and fire Absolutely. up some demos. Yeah. So what have we got here, Simon? Well, we're just going to wait for our. There we go. Hopefully, our screen has now kicked in onto the uh, onto the feed, and we can see what we have. This is our um, a quick overview of our uh, of our demo environment here. Mm. So we have here a um, a uh, Hyper-V server, and on this server itself, we have a file share. So this file server one machine. Yep. I'm just going to pull down though and connect into my uh, remote desktop service That's session yep. into my file share. And this machine has, um, I'm just using Server Manager on the, the machine itself here in order to be able to show you guys what we're, what we're doing here. I think this is a really good way of doing it because it, you won't believe some of the information you're about to see. So um, it's always useful to, uh, mm. to do this directly on the console, I think. In this case, we're inside of Server Manager and you'll be talking about Server Manager a little bit later mm -hmm. on. But here we have our, um, our view of our file server and we're currently looking at our files and storage um, area here. So file and storage services inside of Server Manager. And I can see that I have uh, file server one. I can see it's turned on. Uh, I can see that it's um, got uh, no events on it at the moment. I can see the services that are running against file server one in order to provide file services. So you can see that I have uh, the data deduplication service running. And you can also see that I have the file server service running. And if I scroll down a little bit more, you can see the exact roles and features that are installed onto my server. However, that's not particularly uh, deep information. It's a nice overview of what's happening. Mm. If I pop into my volumes view here, it'll start to show me in a second when it refreshes what volumes I actually have attached to my server that are online. Remember, um, we're talking about volumes here, so a volume has to be online in order for us to be able to yeah. see it. And you notice that I can very quickly pop down to this bottom left pane here and start to create a share. We'll do that in a second. But first off, I'm actually going to um, just pop up to my disks and see what physical disk is attached uh, into this particular server. And in this case, you can see that I have um, these four 64 terabyte drives attached to my server at the moment. Whoa, that, your laptop's pretty yeah, impressive. Yeah, the laptop's uh, uh, kind of chunking away here with, uh, with four 64 terabyte disks in it. Um, but we're going to turn that into something a little bit more useful than uh, four disparate 64 terabyte disks for this file server. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is go and online all of those disks. I'm sure there's some uh, way of automating all of this with a little bit of PowerShell. Indeed, indeed. But, yeah, I uh, think we're not going to put the audience off by showing them PowerShell. So. Absolutely. I think we'll maybe concentrate on a little bit later on. So those disks are now all online and available for me to, to do something with. I'm just going to pop into my storage pools. And from within storage pools, you'll see that I have this primordial disk here, which is actually just a group of disks which has had nothing done to it inside so of the storage pool. that's created for you automatically. You didn't have to do anything. Uh, well, absolutely. Yeah, that's the primordial pool. We now want to actually do something um, with our, uh, our pool here. So we're going to take all of these disks and we're going to go and create a new storage pool. Yep. And then we're going to run through this, uh, this very simple wizard to create the pool. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, read all of that information there and move on to the next screen. Then we need to provide a name for this pool. So pool A. Pretty useful. And we'll say next. Then we say which disks we want to be members of that pool and how we want to allocate them in there. Notice that at this point, what I can actually allocate here is a, an automatic allocation or a hot spare. If I go for automatic, we'll decide on hot spares and all that kind of thing across the whole uh, group. 
as I'm in this case going to do exactly that, we'll go for automatic. If I'd have said hot spare, um, I would have allocated a particular disk as only being used should another disk fail. Yep. Hit create. So it's very similar to sort of the way you would set any other storage up. It's just that we're doing it in, a, in the operating system rather than yeah. down in the weeds in, in hardware. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, we've abstracted away from needing to do things with the hardware at this point. So here, um, my primordial pool has now changed into uh, pool A. Yep. And I can now go and do things with my storage space. And you'll notice as well that my uh, capacity is now up to 256 terabytes. Excellent. So it's aggregated all Where of that. Where did you get this from, from again? Uh, I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> it's one of those very special custom built ones just for Microsoft. OK, so next we'll say um, we want to create a virtual disk on this pool. So just like we would create virtual disks um, for virtual machines, in this case, though, um, we're actually going to create a really, really large virtual disk. So this is going to be called uh, virtual disk. And then we select what type of parity layout we want to uh, provide onto this for uh, redundancy. In this case, I'm going to go with parity and avoid yep. using mirror. And we'll say next. And then I get to decide whether I want to uh, provision this as fixed or thin. In this case, I'm going to use uh, thin provisioning. So as it's required, we're going to add additional space into um, the disk when we need it. So we'll say next for thin and, provisioning. And this is also because actually Simon hasn't got 60 I uh, don't four, actually have terabyte a, in there. Yes, yes there is no, no such thing as a 256 terabyte laptop. So we'll add in our full size there, go for 256 terabytes, say next, and then hit create. And that's going to go away and uh, create a virtual disk for us. 256 terabytes in size, all done. We then need to create a volume on top of that so that we can make that disk usable and make yep. it shareable. So the first thing is that the wizard carries on for us. It starts the create new volume wizard. We're going to say um, that we want to provision this onto server, file server one. Notice that we could create disks on other file servers. Important for a little bit later on. Yes, absolutely. And we're going to say it's 256 terabyte volume, and we're going to assign it a drive letter of E. Gotcha. Going to format it. We could format with ReFS. At this point, I'm going to use NTFS. And then we provide a volume label, uh, new vol. So that would ha that, that if we put oh. REFS in there, it would impact some choices we have downstream from this. We it would, for example, be able to put application file shares on there. Absolutely. Right. Or run uh, deduplication on some of the other features. Yeah. At this point, I'm going to turn off. Uh, I'm not going to actually enable data deduplication on this volume. No. Do that on a different volume. We'll say next, and we'll hit create. And that's now going away and formatting our volume for us, yep. um, just uh, doing the se same kind of setup that it would do against any volume. Obviously, it's doing it against a uh, theoretical 256 terabyte volume, so it does take just that little tiny bit longer. Um, and in fact, I think in the formatting uh, of the volume, we will probably lose um, a little tiny bit of our data. Uh, in this case, that little tiny bit is going to be one terabyte. <laughs> so uh, that kind of thing you have to uh, always remember about, uh, about losing that little tiny bit of overhead whenever you format disks. Uh, we're all quite used to seeing that. A couple of seconds later, that's going to complete. Right. And we can click close. And that storage space has now been created. The next step is, of course, to go and use it for something. So let's go and create a share on that. And this is another new thing that we've introduced with Server 2012, the ability to create different types of shares. And again, to be able to create them remotely. So I could be doing this on a different machine. I click on this Tasks button up here and select New Share. And then we get different types of share that we can create. So in this case, we're actually going to create an application share. However, we could go with a quick share, which um, would be suitable for general file sharing. I always think of this as just actually right-clicking on a folder inside of our um, file explorer and then actually being able to share that way. And I see we also support NFS. So if people want to store VMDK files on here, for example, they, they could do that uh, with an advanced NFS share. Completely. And that could also be clusterable. Yep. So the other types um, that we have available to us, advanced allows us to do things like um, deduplication. It allows us to also do things such as um, access denied messages. Mm. So should somebody from marketing not be able to get into the folder, they have the right person in marketing to go and contact in order to be able to find the folder and actually access it and uh, get themselves added into the right group. We're going to do an application share, and we'll see what that does for us in a second. So we'll say next. We then say whereabouts we want to store it. Strangely enough, we're going to use our 256 terabyte volume. Yep. We're going to give it a share name. I always like to use the name share, uh, nice and descriptive. And then this is what that, uh, what that setting actually did for us. First off, it turned off access-based enumeration, because if uh, one of our databases or Hyper-V is told um, that it has, doesn't have access to the file, that's going to be happy with that. It's not going to need to go and contact Shelley in marketing. 
We also um, are going to turn off caching of this share. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is because we don't actually want people to um, cache the uh, virtual machines that we're going to be sharing out to them. That would be huge, wouldn't they? Uh, it would be huge. It would also potentially cause some um, database inconsistencies if we were using it with, say, yeah, a SQL absolutely. database. I see we can also encrypt as well, Simon. This absolutely. Yeah. Yep. And because I uh, can see the allow caching option now, I know that I've selected the wrong option previously. I'm just going to pop back to Windows. There we go. And select the application share. There we go. Oh, yes. Yeah, so really that's just confirming your choices that you made uh, earlier on in the wizard. Yeah, yeah. That's and better. in this case we have those options grayed out for us, so we can't ch ch uh, change anything yeah. around uh, access based on One thing to actually note there, just to cause out something, branch cache uh, in 2008 R2, it's yep. all about talking to clients. Absolutely. We're going to cover off a lot of the Windows Server 2012 stuff in our session on Windows, Windows 8, 8. Yep. so we're going to park that thought for the moment, so just in case you're expecting to see any of that, not here. Okay, in this case we're going to add in a um, a Hyper-V group here because we're going to be using this mm -hmm. um, file share in order to store some virtual machines later on when we look at doing virtual machine migrations. I'm yep. going to say that we want full um, control for our virtual Hyper-V virtual servers group. And I'll say OK to that. Check. Say next. And then that's going to go and create that file share for us, which it's done. So I, could, I can now put Hyper-V VMs on there. We'll do that in our seg section on, on Hyper-V. Will you come back and we'll reuse that share, I think, Simon? Because you've got a lot of other stuff uh, I think you want to show people. Completely. So the next thing we're going to do is go and have a look at this other disk that I have available to me here. Mm -hmm. I have a disk attached, which is um, literally a 12 gigabyte disk. And right, so okay. I'm going to go and attach that disk in. I'm going to go just go and bring it online. You've got 12 gigabytes yes. disk space. Right, OK. That's Hold that absolutely. thought, everybody. 12 gigabytes of disk, this, this volume is. OK, there we go. We can see our folder there. So I'm now going to just, just pop down and right click and do configure data deduplication. Right. And we're going to enable data dedupe on this volume. So I'll turn that on. We're going to leave the um, deduplication set to five days. Mm -hmm. So what that means is that after five days of a file being at rest on our disk, we're actually going to uh, allow that to be subjected to data deduplication. And I'll come on to what data dedupe is in a second. Right. Then we can specify settings such as particular types of files to exclude. We might have our own custom document format, which we aren't particularly um, sure how well that's going to data dedupe. Obviously, you're going to want to test that kind of thing, um, but we might want to have a, a particular type of exclusion in here. And it's worth pointing out that there are exclusions built in um, to the deduplication algorithm already. Um, for example, we're not going to deduplicate uh, VHD files or um, SQL Server databases. They're because they're open most of the time, and these files by association ought to be closed. We turn that off. There are occasions where you might want to do that, but perhaps we should just move on at this point in time. Absolutely. So at this point, um, we could also provide particular file, uh, sorry, particular folders on this volume mm -hmm. because we are enabling this at a volume level. Right. We could turn on particular folders in order to um, actually enable the total um, deduplication of folders on this volume. Next, we'll pop into uh, our schedule here, and we can set a deduplication schedule because data dedu runs without any particular hardware, it's going to use the processor in order to be able to um, provide access to all of these data deduplication features. Yeah. We then have to decide when we want to run these types of optimizations, and we're going to want to decide to run these in a production environment slightly out of hours because mm. they are going to use a little bit of processor load, and therefore we want to offload that to the times when the server is not necessarily as busy doing general file services. So we've got control from, of that from this UI, or of course we've got PowerShell. Absolutely, yep. We can also do a lot of this with PowerShell. So we'll say OK to that, I'm not going to change the settings, and we'll OK all of these overall settings. OK. That's now configured data dedupe on that volume. If I just pop in and have a quick look at what we have on that disk, this is why um, data deduplication is really good. You can see from here, we have a dedupe um, volume attached here, which is using up six and a half gigabytes of disk space right. of a 12 gigabyte volume. Right, OK, got that okay. so far. So just pay attention to those numbers, because things are about to get a little bit um, quantum. So let's go and have a look at the properties of this disk. Uh, sorry, let's go and open up this disk and have a look what's in there. You notice that we actually have some really um, obvious copies of data here. Yep. So our first copy, if I just hover over that, is going to give us some information about what's in it. OK, let's go have a quick look at its properties. That's a quick way of doing it. And that's just going to add up how much space we've got. So and 5 you can see 5.19 right, okay. gigabytes of space on there. Yep. Okay. We'll have a look at the other copy of that data. And we can see that that's going to add up to 5.19 gigabytes. 10.2, OK, so far. And our third copy is going to add up to 
But 15, oh, I, yeah, roughly 15.6 I've got now, my running total, if I've got this right. Absolutely, and we have another folder here which has got another 800 in it. So OK, so 16 gigs of space on, on a 12 gig volume with 6 gigs free. Absolutely, 6.5 gigs free, six in fact. Yes, free. absolutely. So that's the magic of deduplication. That's right, the magic of deduplication, completely. So let's have, go and have a quick look at a little bit under the hood of what dedupe has just done. Go down and fire open a quick PowerShell command line, and let's just type in um, get dedupe status. Yeah. And that's going to tell us what the status is of dedupe on any of our dedupe volumes. We can see that dedupe has saved us 11.42 gigabytes of disk space wow. on that disk. So it's almost saved us the entire space of the disk. Let's go and drill a little bit further, get the dedupe metadata. And right. gives us a little bit more information. And then one final uh, command here to get a little bit of extra information. And we get DDP volume. So we can see that we're saving 67% of the disk space of this volume. What we've actually done is we've created um, a chunk. We've had a look at the data on the disk. And we've gone through it and said, right, this chunk of bits of data here looks the same as this other chunk of bits of yep. data. So let's redirect the second chunk to the first chunk mm -hmm. and wipe that out from being on our disk. And we've done that inside the NTFS operating system. Absolutely, inside the NTFS file system. And yeah. therefore, there's no dependency on hardware. Absolutely. But two questions I get asked a lot about this, yeah. and I think you do too. Absolutely. One is performance hit yeah. on this. Is it slowing down my system? Not at all. Well, a little tiny bit. For a start, you're going to see about a 3% performance drop. But actually, after a while, because files get cached on the second time that they get read, they, you're actually going to see a performance increase because the, di the files are going to get read from the cache anyway. So this saves you space, but also um, gives you the ability to cache a bit more yep. and therefore to get faster access. And one final question, Simon, which I think perhaps the audience are going to ask us, which I, which, which I, I get asked a lot, is, is backing this up, what are the implications? OK, so that's a really, really interesting question. Um, backups, if you don't have a DDP aware backup, the backup is going to take up the full size of the, um, the duplicated files. So if we had tried to back this disk up right now, um, we know that we have 15 gigabytes of files there, so that's going to be a 15 gigabyte backup. Imagine restoring that back to our 11 gigabyte volume. Yep. That's going to be a bit of a problem, because it's going to be bigger than the volume we've got. Absolutely. So how do we get around that? Well, the backup vendors have to be DDP aware. So our backup yep. software has to be DDP aware. Windows Backup already is. DPM is going to become backup DDP aware in SP1. And you know what? Lots of other vendors have already started to introduce DDP awareness yep into their backups. You may even have a DDP aware backup at the moment without knowing it because they've been working on it for over a year sure. and building the technology in there to be able to understand the spec. And, and we'll be talking about um, System Center in another session and Data Protection Management would be a good example of, of uh, catching up with this deduplication technology. Completely. So there's one more thing I just want to, uh, okay, to show here, which is something that everybody can go home and do now if they download the evaluation. Oh, good plan, um, yeah. So on a machine where we have um, data dedupe installed, there's a way that you can take a binary, pop that uh, onto another machine, and then scan any volume or any, um, any file share from your machine using this executable that you get from Windows Server 2012 from the evaluation, and it'll tell you how much space you will save. So really, really useful thing to be able to do. If we just type in DDP eval. So you need to turn on the deduplication well, feature to have this. Um, to have this access to this EXE because it'll install it. Once you've got it, you can then just copy it off onto a what, Windows 7 machine, Simon? Absolutely, yep. Um, run it onto that machine. It will actually run dedupe against that volume, tell you how much it's going to save. It won't make any changes, but it will run against it. Um, the processor load will also be on your local machine, not on the um, file server. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a good situation to be in as well. Obviously, it's in the eval. Everybody can go and try this. Um, go and give it a try. Then email the results into us with the, uh, the UK IT Pro email address, which will flash up on screen in a little while. And um, we'll have a look at those results and, uh, and see where they go with them. And, eval, uh, and DDP eval means prizes, I think. Uh, it may well do, absolutely. Yeah. OK. Right, I think that's all we want to talk about on storage. On the storage side of things, absolutely. So if you have questions on storage, please ask those questions of us. Please flash those um, back into the, um, into the uh, chat, and we will start to answer those questions uh, as soon as we get five minutes. And speaking of getting five minutes, it's now time to take our first uh, quick break of the morning. Go and grab uh, five minutes, grab a biscuit, and uh, pop back in about five minutes' time. Uh, keep watching the feed, and we'll start to talk about our next topic.